Hey, is this thing working? Yeah, it kind of looks like it's working. Welcome to Flying with Frank. I'm a 50-year-old commercial pilot. I started flying at the age of 16 with the Air Cadets. I flew gliders, and then at the age of 17, also with the Air Cadets, I ended up getting my private pilot license flying single-engine airplanes. At 19, I went to Sioux College and ended up getting my commercial, multi-engine, and instrument ratings there. And then the next year, by the age of 20, my brother and I started a commercial air service. We ended up owning four Cessna 172s like this one. And we did banner flying and traffic reporting all across Canada. At several points, we were the most prolific banner flying company in Canada, flying hundreds and hundreds of banners. And then we also provided traffic reports for hundreds of radio stations across Canada in those banner airplanes. So now I decided to get back into flying because I haven't flown much in the last few years. I've been flying just a few flights per year, but now I want to do it a little more. So I decided to go back and get checked out in a 172 and I decided to start this channel, not just to document my flying and my training, but also just to provide some helpful tips and some good advice and training as far as your flying goes, just to make you a better, more proficient and more professional pilot. Even if you're not going to be a commercial pilot, you should fly like a pro. I'll be able to give you some advice and some tips that keep you alive and keep you flying safe. We'll look at some accidents and incidents along the way as well and do some commentary on that. And overall, just enjoy the joy of flying with me. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for flying with Frank. Is there anything nicer than the sound of a piston engine starting up? I guess one nicer thing would be the sound of a radial piston engine starting up. So we're going to do some forced approaches here, two forced approaches. This is the second of my two-flight checkout in the 172. I'll just let it listen to some. Okay, we're going to check our heading as we line up. So as we're going down the runway here, this thing really likes to start flying by about 55 knots. It's, uh, it's 180 horsepower, 172S. And as you see from this next part of the video here, from, the, uh, from where you see the landing gear, it just leaps off the ground the second you give a bit of back pressure. You don't even actually see the nose wheel lift off the ground. The whole airplane just pops off the ground. That's how every takeoff has been. Imagine if you weigh it down and get four people in there and a lot of fuel, maybe that'd be different. But uh, really impressed with how this airplane performs. Indy Bravo Tango, third on route. Third on route, Indy Bravo Tango. Now I'm going to show you the perspective of the two uh, forced approaches that I did using the track log here in Four Flakes. It's a really valuable tool. So here you see the blue line right here is altitude and the green line is airspeed. So you can see we're right at the point here where I've had the engine pulled, had the engine failure. And I will go through all the cause checks and all that stuff, but I'll do that in the actual video so that you get that in real time. Right here I just want to look at the geography the track line of what engine failure approaches look like because the first one is not good. Um, so the engine failure happens here. I run through my checks and then at about this point right here. So let's move the airplane up to about there. At that point, I've done my cause checks, discovered that the engine's not going to restart, done the rest of my checks and calls, and I've elected to uh, land in this field right here. Right, So I picked the key point, I picked the point to turn base, which is out here, I picked the turn point to turn final, which is out here, and I picked my altitudes for those key points. I made two critical mistakes on this one that ended up causing me a lot more grief than it should have. Firstly, you can see the track line is not square. You see how it kind of, I crab into the field, and that's not an uncommon thing that to happen when you're on a missed approach. There's this kind of fear of squaring off your approach pattern the way it should be. And uh, what happens is, is you move the airplane forward because the actual point that I turn base is right there instead of out here. I've already lost about a quarter mile or I've 
crab myself in closer to the field than I should have by about a quarter mile. Now the field is at about a uh, thousand feet AGL and you can see I'm basically finishing my base turn, if you can see the altitude here, at 2350. So I'm 350 feet too high right now and I've come in about a quarter mile too close. So uh, there is a wind from the west here pushing this way. So that's helping me out a little bit but Right now, the way I'm setting up for this approach, I'm setting up too high. I still have full flaps, and I do drop the full flaps, but, you know, it, it's always nice not to be going into an approach uh, with full flaps where you don't have any more choices of, of, ener of energy dissipation other than maybe a, a forward slip or a side slip, that type of thing. So we move it forward a little bit, and uh, you see where I turn final. And right here, out of my roll to final. Again, you can see I'm, I should have been at about 1,500 feet out of that roll, and I'm around almost 1,900 feet. So I haven't lost the additional altitude. As a matter of fact, I've gained another 100 feet more um, than I that I had when I turned the base. So, and again, in too tight. So we kept the descent coming down for a little while here. The instructor said, you know, I probably would have made the field, but the instructor said, are you happy with this approach? And I said, no, definitely not. He said, okay, well, let's overshoot and do it again. And so then we do the overshoot. And again, suffer an engine failure right about here at about 3,200 feet. So let me just move that into, uh, into a better perspective for you here. So this is the second missed approach. And you can see right off the bat, uh, the pattern is much more square, right, to begin with, that base turn. So that was something that I thought was really important to do. And I knew that I had done a bad job on the first one of keeping the pattern square. Now what happens is, so I get all the checks done here, plenty of time to get all the checks done in a downwind, choose my base point. And this time, as we head into the base turn, come out of that turn, you see I'm at a much better altitude. I want to be a thousand feet off the ground. I'm a thousand one hundred and ten feet off the ground. So I'm only a hundred feet high. Now here's the one sort of oddity that, that happens with practiced engine failures is with these piston engine aircraft in the winter you have to warm the engine when you're doing this engine failure training. So every thousand feet you apply full power and then bring the power back to idle just to keep the engine from shock cooling. Or sometimes, in some cases, I was, I was, I've, in some training I've done, you just bring the engine up into the green arc, then bring it back off. But you have to work that into your approach here because it makes you high. It's all, you add all this bunch of energy that you normally wouldn't have. So at this point here, knowing that I still had one engine warming to do before, before uh, committing to the field, and knowing that I was just a touch on the high side, I told the instructor that what I plan to do is to continue to fly through the extended center line of the field and do a couple S turns, right? And I would do the engine warming in the beginning of the S turn, which meant that uh, I could dissipate that energy on the way back. And coming back to the rest of the S turn, I could reevaluate my altitude and speed and determine if I needed to continue with one or more S turns to go on to final. So, and when you're doing this, it's perfectly fine to do this. Just talk it through with your instructor so that they know what you're doing. Because if I didn't say that and I suddenly flew through the center line, my instructor would know where I'm going or if I'm going for the wrong field or if I'm I've lost the field or that type of thing so having said that to him he was happy with that with that decision and then the execution worked out really well so here's where I brought the power up to do the warm engine warming and you can see coming out of here on the final now I'm well below that 500 foot point just back it up a bit because right about here is where I wanted to be at 500 feet above ground and I am bang on 500 feet above ground there. So I just rolled out the S turn, still had the airplane clean at this point. So at this point I put down flaps 20 and we had the field made really nicely. We kept on coming down for a bit and the instructor said, are you happy with this one? I said, definitely. And we did the overshoot and, uh, and took off. So, um, so again, first one, lessons to be learned, pick your points. Pick your altitudes for those designated points and stick to them. If you don't stick to them, make an adjustment. All right. First one, I didn't make an adjustment, didn't adjust enough, and uh, made the approach much too difficult. Second one, I did make an adjustment and, uh, and continued with another adjustment after the engine warming and had the field made much more easily. 
Now I'm going to show you from the airplane's view uh, what it looks like to do both of these approaches. So I'll just show you uh, two different views of the second forced approach because that was the best one and probably the one where we can learn the most. So right about here, I've suffered the engine failure. You can see me pull the nose up because I'm tr trying to get that last bit of energy to get the uh, glide speed, which is 68 knots in this airplane. And right away, first thing you do is turn towards a, a group of fields and establish that uh, uh, best, uh, best glide speed. Then you do a cause check and I'll try and do it from memory now. And then I'll let you hear the actual audio in the airplane and see how close they match. So you do your cause check, you do a mixture rich, uh, fuel is on both, fuel valve is on, fuel switch is on, masters are, correction mags on both. If the prop is stopped, try to restart with the starter. Masters on, fuel quantity check, no restart. You select your field and you select your landing direction. Look for any obstacles or obstructions in the way and you Calculate your key points. You pick out your key points and your altitudes that you want for the key points of turning base and final. And that's important that you know that so that in case you lose sight of the field, if you can find your key points, then you'll find the field as well. So from here, I usually do the Mayday call. Mayday, 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 Foxtrot, Bravo, India, Tango, Foxtrot, Bravo, India, Tango, Foxtrot, Bravo, India, Tango. 172 complete engine failure, two miles south of the practice area, two souls on board, landing in a farmer's field. Please send fire and rescue. Um, now we'll do the shutdown checks, mixture idle cutoff, fuel is off, uh, fuel switch is off, fuel pump is off, mags off, alternator off, battery on, battery side for radio and flaps. Now we'll do the passenger briefing. We've just had an engine failure. We're going to land in that field over there with the snow on the field. We're probably going to flip over. So crack open your door right now so that you can get out. If you can't open the door, you can just kick open one of these windows and get out. Remember where the fire extinguisher are in the emergency first aid kit. I showed you those in the passenger briefing. Turn the emergency locator transmitter on right now like I showed you in the briefing as well. Take any loose uh, correction sharp objects out of your pockets. Take off your glasses. Grab that coat and put it in front of your face when we get down. I'd like you to pull your cell phone out too and call 911 and talk talk with them all the way through this procedure. So you can see now we're turning base and um, we basically started the engine failure at 3,500 feet and I wanted to turn my base at 2,000. Um, and this is all ASL, so, uh, which puts me about 1,000 feet off the ground. So that at 700 feet per minute gives you about two minutes to complete all of those checks. Um, and this is something that you need to do from memory. You can't be pulling out an emergency checklist at this time. So practice this at home, you know, practice the flow of it, practice the, uh, the verbiage and how you go through it and what you're going to look at and what you're going to touch, um, in your cockpit to, uh, to do or to simulate so that you get it done quickly because now it's all done. Now I can just worry about the approach itself and we're at the two critical and final and so at this point i know i'm a touch high and i've told my instructor that i'm going to fly through the center line a little ways and then do a couple of s turns on the way back in those s turns i have to do the uh, engine warming and uh, you'll start to see the field coming up soon as we start to do this s turn to the left and start to bleed off energy to make uh, to make the field in good shape You can actually hear the engine rev up here as we do uh, the engine warming. And now you'll see the field coming off the nose wheel right about now. So we've already flown through the center line once. Now we're going to fly through the center line a second time. And then come back with another S turn to the right. And this way you're not, not turning away from the field. Turning away from the field is a big no-no when you've had an engine failure. It's a good way to lose track of the field. And here, although it looks like there are a lot of fields that are options, there are, but the odd field might have a power line or might have a fence row that you don't see from altitude. So you want to stick to the field that you picked because you picked it for a reason, right? Unless something changes down low. 
But here I'm just flying through the center line one more time and then a left turn to head back to the field. And the field comes through the nose wheel right about there, just landing past that road. So now as I make my last turn on to final, I start to drop 10 degrees flap. You'll see the flap right at the very top just starting to come down there. And then I go right to uh, another 10 degrees of flap for 20 degrees flap. And I plan this landing out for 20 degrees flap. At this point, we're looking really good to land in that first third of the field. So the instructor says overshoot. Um, the way I like to overshoot these planes is go full power, carb heat cold if you have carb heat. And look at your speeds. If you've got positive rate and VX, which is best angle of climb speed, you bring one notch of flap up, keep the accelerating going and the rate climbing, and you get best rate of speed, best rate of climb speed, and you bring that second notch of flap up, and you keep climbing at best rate and with a positive rate. So, so that's how that uh, engine failure ended up happening. Now I'm going to let you listen into the audio in the cockpit now it's it's not the greatest audio and it's a little loud so but just try and listen because <laughs> Thank you. 
passing essentially the center line of the arch. Okay. It's easy to pass it, but keep the air, keep the field in my vision. And just more or less do an S turn. Okay. To get us back. Okay, so there's the overshoot, and now I just wanted to give you a bit of video of the final approach here into the uh, Toronto Island Airport, because uh, I might be a little biased, but this is a really beautiful skyline that you see to the right there. Toronto is one of the nicest skylines in the world, but you only see it from this viewpoint, from over the water, and uh, a lot of people don't get to make over the water approaches to island airports, and I've got probably over three hours of do it, three thousand hours of doing it here at this airport, and I really enjoy it. So some people say they get a little queasy, uh, not having land underneath them as they get really low. But I wanted to show you this uh, video, this landing in particular, because I ended up greasing on the landing really nice, but the instructor. Uh, kind of makes fun of me and says that it was a nice landing but it was kind of wonky so just listen out here i'll let you hear how the stall horn uh sounds when you're touching down and uh just hear the comments and thanks a lot for uh for watching this video and if you like what you see please like and subscribe it means a lot to me